Okay. Uh, Gene Farmer-Donald has been the executive director of three nonprofit organizations based in Palo Alto. Of those three, she founded the Women's Heritage Museum and served as its executive director for a decade. Uh, during this time, she oversaw programs that included designing and scheduling an exhibit about Juana Briones and another about California women's suffrage and helping on research and programming for tours of the Juana Briones House. Jean? Hilaria Bauer, please wave if I call your name and you're here. Marta Escalera, Patricia Montes Gregory, Olga Loya, uh, Thelma Muni, Aurora Quevedo, Andres Quintero, Consuelo Rodriguez, Hiroshima Sanchez, and Mary Jane Solis. Back. Uh, they should be as big as the screen, but it's not going to work that way. So, Juana would have figured it out. Um, well, I, I tried, and I really wanted to pick one thing. I wanted to say, we honor Juana for so that you go home with that memory, but there are so many things to honor Juana Briones in Tapia de Miranda for that I just couldn't say one. So what I wanted to do, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to first tell you a personal story, how I met this woman, why she still matters to me all these years later. And then I'm going to tell you mostly about her life in this county where we are gathered today. It says, Playa de Juana Briones. And this is called the third map of Yerba Buena. The first two maps were lost, and this was a rendering, a new rendering. It is Yerba Buena in 1833. And I have, all these years, I found myself gazing at this map. And actually, a couple of weeks ago, it occurred to me what has fascinated me about this map. It was drawn up in 1833. At that time, as far as I know, now I did not meticulously research this, I thought of it a couple of weeks ago, there was no land in California named for an individual. They simply, a living individual, they did not do that. They named everything either for religious purposes, San Jose, Santa Clara, or for something ecological. The, the uh, rancho of her brother in Marin County was Bolinas for uh, whale. The rancho of her sister and brother-in-law, which is now Half Moon Bay, was Pilarcitos. That was supposed to be a rock that was offshore. So they would name them for that, but a living individual, I don't believe they did. And here is the original map of the city that became San Francisco with a place called your uh, Juana Briones on it. There's also, you might be able to see the little circle near the beach, that was called Briones Lagoon. The little house up the hill, the little box, that was her house. So this, this was an extremely amazing, that's what all these years I've been gazing at that map and I finally realized that. This was an extremely special situation. Then the place was called Yerba Buena and it was said to be called that because she made such delicious tea from the good herb she harvested from Loma Alta, which is the, tree, the hill right there, which is now Telegraph Hill. She made such delicious tea and the dignitaries who came from the capital at Monterey, who came on business to her, to Yerba Buena, she served that tea and they called the community that Yerba Buena after her tea. Now these are stories and there may be people will, who will say, oh, that's only a story. But it is something that I learned to appreciate that much of what the best stuff we learn about history is from stories. The second picture there is, that's where I come in. 
Well, wait, first I will tell you something I wrote down I forgot to say about a naming thing. Is that better? Is that better? <laughs> um, the thing about naming things, they did name Franza Forte, where Juana was born, after the, king's the king of Spain's representative in Mexico, because they thought, well, he would give money that way and would support the project. And also, um, uh, but other, but individual names. Then 14 years later, Mariano Vallejo did name the city of Venetia after his wife. But this is 1833. That was very early to have such a thing happen. It was 11 years after the date of that map that Juana took the opportunity to expand her prosperous dairy business down the peninsula. In 1844, as Olga mentioned, she purchased from Indians the 4,400-acre Rancho La Purissima Concepcion, land which is now located in Los Altos Hills, Los Altos, and Palo Alto. Robert Frost was born in San Francisco when Juana was 73 years old. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. My path diverged the first day in 1986 that I entered the Juana Brioni's house on Old Adobe Road in Palo Alto. Something about that place spoke to me and still speaks to many others. And the picture on the right is the dining room as it looked when I first entered that house. Okay. And those are two more pictures. Uh, the one on the right. Thank you. Am I too close to it? Oh, okay. How's that? <laughs> Just raise your hand if the sound isn't good in the back. The one, the picture of the fireplace on the right, there was uh, a cement uh, hearth, and there was a child's footprint in that hearth. And the grandson of Juana, Tomas Dimas Mesa, said that was his footprint. It looked like the size of maybe a two or three year old child. He said he was born in that house and that was his footprint. So this is the kind of thing that really, uh, I can say spoke to me when I walked in the door of that house in 1986. Juana managed the ranch with a kind of diligence and perfection that few others achieved when they underwent the need to adapt to a new form of government, rules of business and land ownership, culture and language. Here we go, again, another uh, of the ranch, very much as it is today. Okay, with the next, next slide. Okay, again, I'm sorry, that map on the right is difficult for you to see, but that is a map of the Rancho La Purissima Concepcion with a dotted line drawn between it. And that was the, she sold about half the ranch to Martin Murphy. One move that helped her was selling half of the ranch to Martin Murphy, a member of the first party to make it across the Sierra with their wagons intact. 1870s for her to divide up her remaining property among her children, each of whom could put a cabin on their land and thus discourage squatters. This transaction, like others, indicates that she figured out how to adapt to the times. And I suspect that many of you know that most of the landowners lost their land. A descendant of Mariano Vallejo, who was the owner of vast estates, said there was not enough money for his funeral when he died. I don't know if that's really true, but that's what happened to many, many people. One aspect of her life that is documented almost entirely through stories, many stories, 
was what I will call her genius at healing. One personal experience for me was being contacted one day by the historian of the Bolinas Historical Society, who visit, invited me to visit, along with other members of the Women's Heritage Museum Committee that provided tours of the Juan Brioni's house for students and the general public. Next slide. One reason they wanted to meet us is that Juana Brioni's is, still is an icon in their community. She had trained her nephew, Pablo Brioni's, in medicine, and he became, to quote a doctor, another uh, historian of uh, Bolinas, he became the beloved doctor of Bolinas for 50 years. One event that people of that community never forgot was Juana's being called in at the terrible, devastating moment in 1853 when smallpox struck. She set up a quarantine that saved many lives and so inspired her nephew that he became her student. In 1848, when the surveyor Chester Lyman boarded at Juana's house, the same house that still remains on Old Adobe Road in Palo Alto, he mentioned that she was caring for two sick patients in her home, one an Indian girl with a severe cough, the other a man, Portuguese, Chester thought. He wrote in his diary that he was comfortable there. I counted up the number of people he mentioned as staying in the house at the same time, and it was 16 making it something of a household achievement that he was comfortable there. He mentioned that the daughters did the cooking. They were in their teens at the time. Juana brought up her children to be hard workers the same way she was. An honored folk doctor gives a clue to her personality. She cared for one and all, regardless of language, color, derivation, or social status an essential factor that contributed to her formidable reputation. She was what we would call today a humanitarian. Oh. Uh, the photo on the right was taken approximately in 1900. At that time, the house was on 350 acres and had a view of the bay. That sloping view now contains other houses but the house itself looks much the same, except that the owner now permits broken windows and open doors that threaten demolition by neglect. The land would be more valuable in today's real estate market without a historic structure. Some of us who care want to ask the owner to donate the property to a nonprofit organization or a coalition of organizations. I am a member of the Board of PATH, Palo Alto's Preservation Organization, and of the Palo Alto Historical Association. On both boards, I represent the issue of preserving the house, but we are well aware that we need much broader interest and participation. I firmly believe that the impact that the house made on me, as one example, makes a case for preservation. This photograph of Juana was about a year ago donated to the archives at the Point Reyes National Seashore by the seventh generation of the family that had preserved it over those many years. Words and pictures are so essential. This picture was a revelation to many people, to me very much, but to others, people who had worked on the house, Olga, um, and it is so beautiful that the family that preserved that picture brought into the National Seashore Archive the generations, the genealogy of each generation that had treasured and preserved that picture over those years. And it is not like a little photograph you might have in a drawer somewhere. It is more like a beautiful painting that you would put over a mantle. It is a gorgeous picture and it just 
to me and many other people just said, this really does speak of the person she was. But I firmly believe, as much as I'm invested in words, the book tells you I care much about words. I care about pictures. I think these images are extremely important. But to me, there is nothing that conveys a message as strongly as physical objects. California and the nation need to honor the history of women and of Hispanic California. What <laughs> move that cause along than now by preserving the house of Juan Abriones and making it accessible as a historic site. Thank you. I would be very pleased to take questions, and I, as you might notice, I have a hearing aid. So when you do ask, I, I hope you'll speak loud and clearly. So could I? Is there anyone who has a question? Yes. Clark and Kathy Akatip are here. When we learned about this house, the owner negotiated a deal with us. She got a Mills Act contract by which her um, tax was greatly reduced, and we got the right to take the public into the house 20 days a year. And the beautiful thing was that our, our tours were packed. We would... Uh, to schedule a whole day of tours. We would only allow one, uh, 15 people with each tour leader, and we would five, have five, six tours every time. Also, schools came into the house. But it actually looked, those pictures were taken when I first saw the house, 1986. And seven and eight. I shouldn't say just one year, but it, it was right in the, in the early 1980s. But now, they, it, when she sold the house, we thought that other people would respect the same. We just assumed that other people would do the same thing, but they didn't. And so now the present owner, the neighborhood has uh, uh, built up a lot since we first went in. And other people now have built rather large, imposing houses there. So the owner of the property, if they could tear it down, it would be a lot more valuable than it is with that house. They, they don't want to fix it up. And they're letting it fall apart. Yes? Is there a cemetery on the property? Oh, well, you know, that's, that's But uh, I don't know what you're thinking of, because the, um, and a historic organization, Ecompas Fetus, uh, got a tombstone for Juana's grave. She's buried with a good many other of the family members in Holy Cross Cemetery in Menlo Park. And they got a tombstone there, so there. But there are probably Indian burials on the property. And I don't know that, but we have had an archaeologist look, and it's a fabulous place for Indians. Yeah. homesteads, and some of those properties have family cemeteries on the property. So this is the reason why I was asking you that if in her property they had a family cemetery. All the family members are buried up at Holy Cross Cemetery. Others moved out into the valley, but um, the early first family members are in the cemetery there. Yeah. 